On behalf of the Department of Physics, it is a pleasure for me to invite teachers and students to visit the observatory at the University of Saskatchewan. It is easy to kindle an interest in the discipline of astronomy. With the advent of the space age, the study of astronomy has been steadily increasing. This slide set will acquaint you with various features of the observatory, in particular the main instrument in the dome and the extensive displays prepared by the museum committee. In 1907, the Saskatchewan Legislature passed the University Act to establish a provincial university within the city of Saskatoon. The University of Saskatchewan was developed for the purpose of providing facilities for higher education in all its branches and enabling all persons without regard to race, creed, or religion to take the fullest advantage. Today, the U of S is the largest educational institution in the province. As the campus continues to thrive and grow, some of its buildings still maintain a unique historical character. One of the first few buildings established at the U of S was the Campus Observatory. Constructed in the late 1920s, it was used for astronomical research and viewing of celestial objects. Between 1928 and 1930, the Campus Observatory was built in two phases. The R.J. Aaron Contracting Company was hired to build the Observatory Tower in 1928 for a cost of $6,625. The firm completed the tower under budget on the 14th of April, 1929. In that same year, on the 20th of June, the same company was granted a second contract by the university, this time to build the small classroom wing of the observatory for $15,640. Work on the classroom was completed on the 23rd of January, 1930. A combination of university funding together with private donations allowed the observatory to be built, Today, a plaque is still present, mounted inside the dome, with some recognizable names inscribed. If you begin with the plaque that hangs on the inside of the wall, uh, in the upper dome area, there are some names there. Uh, John East comes to mind, Aidan Bowman comes to mind. These are names of some fairly significant figures in the past of Saskatoon. The fact that it was one of the few buildings on campus in the campus's beginnings is significant. I think it's uh, quite exciting that just after the administration was bu building was built that somebody had the insight to build an observatory. Um, much smaller, of course, but the funding was there to do it. As buildings and trees continue to grow up around the observatory and technological advances have allowed researchers to dig deeper into the universe with more sensitive instrumentation, the observatory has been used less and less for research and by the 1970s the observatory was being used almost exclusively for public outreach by allowing the public to tour the facility and view celestial objects. Today, it serves that same purpose by providing free tours on Saturday nights to the public. We use the campus observatory for undergraduate labs in astronomy, and we also use it as an outreach uh, focus for, uh, for the general public. So we invite the public to come to the campus observatory on any Saturday night. We open it up year-round, and usually you have a couple of, of students or volunteers from the Royal Astronomical Society who are who staff the building for us and are there to answer questions and to help people take a look uh, through the telescope there uh, at celestial objects. The observatory has gone through several modifications and upgrades since its inception in 1929. A primary figure in the 1970s who pushed for observatory renewal was Ed Kennedy, a former assistant dean of arts and science. Ed Kennedy was involved in the College of Arts and Science. Uh, his, he was basically in charge of the University Observatory, and, both with its upkeep, maintenance, and tours. And so he was, in effect, my boss. Um, and at that time, the observatory was uh, in a little bit of disrepair, and he uh, managed to scrape up $30,000 worth of funding to renovate uh, the displays in the observatory and the dome that sits uh, on top of the observatory. So during his time, 
And the time that I was working there, we watched the dome, the old dome removed and a new metallic ash dome come in. And we also watched uh, a circular room downstairs under the telescope become a display room instead of a storage area. We also saw the introduction of space for a fully equipped dark room and a library and um, uh, washrooms for the public, proper washrooms for the public. Also in the 1970s, the original 7-inch telescope lens was replaced with a 6-inch lens that is still used today. It's a refracting telescope, a long tube refractor, 6-inch diameter front lens. And uh, as a long tube refractor, it is very, very good for planetary viewing. And um, that really is where it shines. Um, it is well anchored uh, into a concrete pier, which runs all the way down through the display room in the uh, basement area of the telescope, and then even further down into the ground under that. In the 1950s, a sundial was installed on the south wall of the observatory. The sundial read, I am a shadow, so art thou, I mark time, dost thou? Beneath the quotation was an equation that could be used for calculating the time. The sundial proved to be useful for those who knew how to use it and those who didn't. If you walked by there during the day, uh, at the bottom of the sundial was the equation of time, which basically taught you that if you looked at the gnomon and it wasn't the right time, if you applied the equation of time, it would come out right, which it did. Over the years that um, it was restored several times, um, the black lettering was touched up and the layers of um, varnish or shellac, whatever they were putting on it, was, was improved. But I always found it, I was only there at night, really. Most of my time was spent there at night. And I always found it humorous at 10 o'clock at night when the last bus was leaving the University of Saskatchewan to take students home. Students would commonly walk by the, the walkway in front of the observatory. And every third or fourth student could be seen looking at the sundial, which by, by coincidence happened to be, have a shadow from the standing light right near it that hit 10 o'clock. And they would look at the sundial, Nomen. They would look at the shadow reading 10 o'clock. They would look at their watch and they would walk away happy that all was right in the universe. Probably the greatest upgrade to the observatory was in the late 1970s when the original dome from 1929 was replaced with a new aluminum ash dome. When I was associated with the observatory in the late 1970s, uh, the observatory had just had an upgrade. Uh, the old uh, chicken wire and plaster dome was replaced by a very nice aluminum ash dome and uh, that really dressed the observatory up. Several years after that, the observatory was chosen to be on the cover of the Ash Dome catalog. Uh, so it was a very picturesque observatory. It's in a beautiful location on campus. And uh, the building had been taken care of and upgraded uh, around that time. Surprisingly, the original dome found a new home when Harry Tarasoff, a partner in a local asphalt company, found the dome in a scrapyard. He was coming home from... Uh work one day in the north end of Saskatoon and saw it in, um, in a, an industrial yard uh, and saw it on the ground and knew immediately what it was. So he stopped and went in and asked the owner uh, if he could buy it. And the owner was, well, no, <laughs> I bought it, you know, on sale and I store pop bottles in it because <laughs> he also collected pop bottles I guess uh, but Harry spoke to him some more and gave him a good enough price so he sold it. Being a graduate from the Department of Physics Tarasov was a keen amateur astronomer and a passionate problem solver and builder. He was always figuring out what made things work. He, he could uh, he just was always thinking about those kinds of things. And I think that's what stargazing was for him. It wasn't It wasn't just seeing a star, it was figuring out what the star was, how it got there, you know, what what happened that it, it got where it was. In 2008, 
Tarasov passed away due to a blood clot. The observatory he built is a token of his memory and still remains with his wife Karen Larson in their backyard. Often by having it in my backyard, people have stopped in the back lane. And I've been in the yard and asked me about it, rolled down their windows and asked me about it, and asked me what it is, actually. And I tell them. And often, you know, they express that that's, you know, great. And I tell them that they should, there's one at the university, an observatory that has open hours for the public, that they can go and take their children and, and go and look through it. And it's free. The observatory is open year-round on Saturday nights for public viewing, but it is also open for any significant celestial events. The observatory has been known to have hundreds or even thousands of excited sightseers show up to such events. I think one of the most impressive sights I've ever seen in astronomy was looking through this telescope at Saturn for the first time when I was young. And it's really neat to be able to see the rings of Saturn. Uh, for yourself through a telescope. So you can see Saturn's rings, you can see the moons of Jupiter. Uh, if you take a, uh, other planets, uh, when they are visible can be, can be seen. Uh, the f different phases of Venus can be seen through the telescope as well. Um, then there's a number of other uh, objects that f are frequently visible, uh, such as uh, globular star clusters. You can see M13 in, in Hercules. Uh, there's some open star clusters, uh, some say the Pleiades in the wintertime. It just looks like the sky is, is, uh, has been dotted with uh, di diamond dust or something. It, you just see glitters of stars, hundreds of stars filling up the field of view when you take a look at uh, the Pleiades. So there's a number of star clusters like that. There's nebulae. You can take a look at one of the neatest ones is the, um, the ring nebula, which sort of looks like a smoke ring in space. So. Uh, we can point the telescope at that and and hopefully be able to see that uh, that uh, strange uh, circular uh, p pattern of light that's being emitted from what we call in astronomy a planetary nebula. So there's quite a variety of objects like that that can be seen. And in uh, on special occasions, there are some really special objects that can be seen. Recently, last summer, we had the transit of Venus. So we had... Uh, several hundred people in line on one afternoon uh, where we uh, put the telescope on on the sun. We have a special filter that does allow us to safely view the sun with our campus observatory telescope because that's otherwise a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, and so with the filter in place we were able to uh, watch uh, Venus as it traveled across the face of the sun in between the clouds. We had a bit of a few clouds for that. So that was one very significant event uh, fairly recently. We've seen also passing transits of the planet Mercury in front of the sun and also comets. Um, probably the most significant event that I can remember uh, at the campus observatory was the, um, the appearance of Halley's Comet. Uh, it was uh, back in, I think it was way back 1986 or so, uh, when Halley's Comet came, came around, 85, 86. And that's a, the most famous comet uh, in, in, uh, in history. Uh, and it's been coming by every, every 70 foot some years, 75 years or so for, for, I think we have now documented records of the appearance of Halley's Comet uh, for 2,000 years. But the 1985 appearance was actually the worst one in, in 2,000 years. So people actually did need to come to a telescope to see Halley's Comet. So uh, we, we opened it up every evening that the comet was visible and we had huge, huge crowds of people, uh, several thousand people in line uh, trying to uh, see Halley's Comet. So uh, we, over the course of a, several weeks, so we had probably a good chunk of the population of Saskatoon actually got a chance to see Halley's Comet. As the city of Saskatoon continues to expand and populate, Light pollution is a growing concern for viewing conditions at the campus observatory. Okay, light pollution is light that shines where you don't want it at night. So that includes sideways where it does no work or up into the sky where it simply, simply pollutes the atmosphere. And it's also light that is too bright for the purpose that's intended. Animals are affected, plants are affected by uh, light pollution. So we have problems with 
frogs um, trying to cross the roads and we have problems with birds migrating and seeing the lights and thinking it's something that it isn't. So it's a huge issue, light pollution, way bigger than just, you know, our intellectual ability to study the stars is not there. It's way bigger than that. We should always be concerned about light pollution because we're losing our access to the skies from the city. And even beyond that, we're losing access to the night skies outside the city as cities grow larger and begin to merge together. It is, it's really becoming difficult to find a location where you cannot see sky glow at all. When I was growing up in Saskatoon, we could easily see the Milky Way overhead in Saskatoon. I went across, uh, out into the park, across the back alley from my house, and no problem seeing uh, the Milky Way in all its glory. It's almost like an astronomer's nightmare. Uh, it's something I probably complain about almost every night. <laughs> uh, it, even if you are in the city and you just look up at the sky, uh, you can see a few stars and a few planets, um, but anyone that's in the countryside camping, it's a totally different image. Saskatoon community members, as well as individuals from the Royal Astronomical Society, have taken the initiative in Saskatoon to push for lighting fixtures that are efficient at directing the light downwards. I've been helping to preserve dark skies in Saskatoon by pushing City Council to introduce a lighting policy for Saskatoon. And in 2006, they did exactly that. They introduced a policy called the Saskatoon Comprehensive and Integrated Dark Sky Policy. And what that means is that the city will manage their lighting design uh, by using lights that do not create light pollution and uh, will make sure that their roadways, their facilities, uh, buildings, parks, walkways are all lit with respect for the nighttime sky. In addition, several dark sky preserves have been established around Saskatchewan. Within these areas, lighting is regulated to be protective of the nighttime sky. In 2004, the RASC declared the Cypress Hills Provincial Park as a dark sky preserve. In 2009, the Grasslands National Park was also made into a dark sky preserve and is currently one of the darkest places in Canada. Light pollution is an inevitable consequence of everyday life, but even taking small measures to redirect lighting fixtures can make a big difference for our night skies. When we talk about light pollution, we don't talk about all light at night. Uh, people that implement light pollution programs are not asking people to necessarily turn out lights, but to basically use the light responsibly and shine it only where you need it and when you need it. Despite detrimental light pollution that impedes our viewing conditions, the U of S Campus Observatory is being used on a weekly basis for public viewing. For nearly 100 years, the Campus Observatory has acted as a bridge to establish a connection between the University of Saskatchewan and the general public. There's still a lot of bright objects, the, the planets and some of the brighter deep sky objects and bright comets we can easily show to people when they come to the observatory. Still today, the stars generate a sense of awe in all of us. This is demonstrated by the interest and continuing attendance at the Campus Observatory on Saturday nights. Looking at the night sky, we start asking the most fundamental questions about our existence as a human species. The science of astronomy brings empirical evidence to those questions. Every culture has a historical and scientific understanding of the stars. So astronomy is really important for that. I think for the big questions about the origins, our origins, the origins of the universe, astronomy really digs into those in amazing ways. It was because of astronomy that calculus was invented, and of course some people might think that that's a terrible thing, but it was the first time that I really understood, oh, that's what calculus is. You know, I'd taken calculus, but once I realized why it was there, then it, it just made a whole lot more sense. I um, really got into it uh, in my first year of university and, uh, and stuck with it right through to a PhD, um, just because I find it all just fascinating. Uh, every, every aspect of, of sort of the picture that we have of our universe is such a, it's such a complex and interconnected sort of self-consistent picture that, that works so well in, in uh, describing reality.
The Campus Observatory is an example of the university's initial motivations for promoting science, innovation, and technology in the community, values that are still apparent at the university today. Being accessible to the public, the observatory has provided an initial avenue for the younger generation to establish an interest in the sciences and technology. The observatory, you can see it as a, a tool or a vehicle for um, enticing or educating younger generation who are not yet uh, deeply involved in astronomy's education, of, uh, astronomy studies. Huh? For example, you can go to the campus observatory or you could go to Sleaford Observatory or you can even, with the permission of the instructor, come and take a look at uh, what is happening on the, on the roof of uh, physics building. And then you would see how uh, amazing the, the, the stellar structures, galactical uh, arrangements are when the meteorite shower is happening and so forth. And we have uh, staff members, dedicated staff members who are passionate about this area. And then along with many student volunteers uh, uh, coming and helping out other people to get acquainted with these subjects. Uh. The campus observatory has been used extensively for undergraduate courses at the U of S. The physics department offers many options for students who wish to pursue astronomy at the undergraduate or graduate level. We have uh, at the undergraduate level, um, one program we have is a minor in astronomy. So students within the College of Arts and Science, if they want to do a major in some subject other than physics, uh, if they're interested in astronomy, then they can take a number of astronomy classes as, as electives and then graduate with a minor in astronomy tacked on to their major program. Uh, a second option, uh, which is designed for those students who really want to go uh, further in their education in astronomy, and that would be for those students who, who would then uh, take uh, an honors physics uh, degree uh, through the College of Arts and Science, and then within that uh, degree program, they, they can take a number of astronomy classes which will be uh, used towards their astronomy specialization within the honors physics program. The university will continue to see new students with the same passions and interests related to astronomy that people have felt for millennia. We cannot ignore how the observatory has nurtured the sense of wonder in countless numbers of people since the early days of the university. Society starts from the, the time a kid is born. And uh, considering the university is a part of the community and a part of the society, and having these facilities, having these uh, opportunity, having these uh, establishments in the campus, uh, by providing them uh, uh, access to the publication, public, public, the university is not only serving the pu public, but the university is serving itself. Uh. So, because uh, that is a good citizen, and the future lies with the younger population, and if we don't care about the younger population, we don't have a future. It's more than a job, it's kind of something touching. We're giving you a chance to uh, spend some time on a Saturday night talking about stuff you love and sharing that with other people, to the public, to anyone that wants to come and look and listen. Uh, so it's almost it's just like a fun thing to do. <laughs> it's not really a job. With the screening of this beautiful sunset, you realize that the end of this presentation has been reached. In closing, may I quote the opening sentence from Ferguson's Astronomy, a text which appeared well before the year 1800. Quote, of all the sciences cultivated by mankind, astronomy is acknowledged to be, and undoubtedly is, the most sublime, the most interesting, and the most useful. End of quote.